another one of my favorite quotes about scientific knowledge is that the extent of, of possibilities lies in the limits of our dreams. What that means is that if you can imagine it, it's probably possible. We just kind of we haven't gotten to the point of doing it yet. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Lima, I can imagine a lot of stuff, like dragons and magic. Well, what you call magic might just be something that you currently don't understand and that we currently don't have the power to do. Certainly people would have called going to the moon or flying magic. And now it's something that it's done. It's common ground. It is something that flying, for example, happens every day. And so magic is just what we don't understand. But this is a dangerous slippery slope with science. Because if you can imagine anything, then you can possibly do anything. For example, cloning. Someone wants to imagine that it would be cool to make a exact biological copy of an organism. I mean, life does it with twins, so why can't we create a copy of an organism that already exists? Even further, why can't we copy the thoughts of a person and then transfer those thoughts into the clone and that way we could live forever? Now, it may sound like science fiction and there are certainly lots of science fiction movies about just that, but if you really look at it, you will see that that is completely possible. Once we completely understand the way the brain works and how the circuitry of the brain works, we can perhaps mimic memories and copy them. And we already can clone the body of someone. It's just a matter of accelerating the growth now so that we can make, 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 we can make it so that the person can uh, be transferred to another body or version of itself. But can you imagine the implications of having two copies of yourself floating around the world? Just, there's a lot of movies about that out there you know, that you can see. Or, but you didn't even have to go that far. What about cloning, uh, making a copy of you just to get the organs of that copy if you're dying? So you kill that copy just so you can survive. Or don't go that far. What about just the stem cell research, you know, which are cells from embryos which are not human really, maybe, arguably, who knows? It's up to you to decide. Is it the moment of conception that makes the baby be alive or not? But the moment that that, that, that embryo is there and now it has the potential to become all the cells in your body, because that's what happens. That little embryo splits and becomes everything that you are. So can't we just then use those cells and tell them which organ to become, which if we learn enough about how the embryonic process happens, we can probably control. Remember, it's about predicting and then control. So if you can control that, we can just say, hey, let's get these stem cells and make a heart for that person who's dying and needs a heart transplant. But then those stem cells were going to be a person, but they're not going to be a person anymore because you made it a heart with them. But remember that those stem cells were going to be thrown out anyways, because you see when a couple goes to a fertility clinic, they usually do these treatments, which makes the, 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 the girl do a lot of eggs. And then all of these eggs are artificially inseminated, but they don't usually implant all of the eggs. Like they will have eight and they will implant four. And that's why you have this quadruplets or something like that. But then, if you implant all eight, you could maybe get octoplets like the Octomon. But either way, normally they don't do that. And then if you have then the ones you didn't use, what happens to them? Well, ultimately they get thrown out. So why not just use them for, for a good purpose rather than throwing them out? Or shouldn't you have made that in the first place? Should, is the whole artificial simulation already wrong? Is it already pushing it too far? Is it already playing God? You want to talk about playing God? How about if we understand genetics and know exactly what genes cause what? And in a lot of cases, we do. We know exactly what genes cause what. So let's say, for example, you knew that there's a certain gene in your body that causes you to have a disease called sickle cell anemia. And that if you have the disease, you more likely you will die. Although there's a lot of good treatments that let people live a long time. But if, let's say, you're poor, you don't have access to those treatments. But the government has this free program that they scan your baby or the, the egg before it becomes, you know, in, in, a, in a woman, and you can genetically engineer that egg to remove the gene for that disease if you do have it, so that you don't have that problem. Would you do it? Why stop there? Why not make your child stronger, faster, more intelligent, better looking? Why not make your child more sociably inept, mathematically oriented, emotionally driven, musical? Why not add anything you want? Why not fabricate your own child. Where is the limits of what's okay to do and what's not okay to do?
That's some food for thought. And we're definitely going to be discussing these ideas more when we get to class. And these are just some of the things that scientists can be controversial in biology. There's also genetic engineering of, of grown of foods. A lot of people say there's a problem because it makes the crops be all the same. And that's, there's a redu reduction of biodiversity, which makes the ecosystem less sustainable. Uh, there's also uh, farms um, where we choose these uh, genetically engineered uh, crops. And people say that it's bad to eat those foods because it causes consequences for our bodies. Hormonally enhance uh, meats, which also causes things like cancer, per perhaps. So, the thing about pushing the limits of science is that we can never know all the consequences of what could happen. And so, we need some sort of guiding lights to guide us in the ethical conduction of science. So that we don't end up going too fast and not carefully enough. And then, you know, doing things we shouldn't do. During World War II, under the umbrella of science, atrocities were done with people in concentration camps. They, they burned people alive. They put people in oil and then in cold water just to see their fast reaction. They opened people up when they were still living. They did things which are unspeakable. They did mental studies. They did all kinds of research which would be definitely unethical because it's hurting people. But they did it for the love of science. So you see how science can become dangerous. You know, uh, if you could choose the, what's better and what's not. And we'll talk about when we get to genetics, for example, that, that there is no good gene. That gene of sickle cell anemia protects you from other diseases like malaria. So now you took it off, everybody dies of malaria. See what I'm saying? There's a gene which causes a problem for, for some cells in your body, but that same gene makes you incapable of contracting AIDS. HIV cannot infect you. So what seems wrong here is good somewhere else. So it's very dangerous to play with science, especially with biology. And so what, how do we know what's good and what's not? On the next video, we're going to be talking about the guiding lights of ethics and how do scientists make decisions about what's the best thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. See you guys then.